So, you know, the things that make us the most amazing and the most unique and really stand out and come more naturally when done at the wrong time to an intense degree can sometimes cause harm or not serve us or do the opposite of our intended actions. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the podcast. It's Eileen. Today, we are discussing Enneagram, which are personality types based off why we do what we do. So we'll talk about understanding our motivations and how to release the unhealthy aspects of them. And we also touch on self-love, lifestyle, and creativity. Our guest today is Sarah Jane Case. Sarah Jane is first and foremost, a passionate advocate for your loving relationship to self. She's the author of popular self-help books, The Honest Enneagram, as well as The Enneagram Letters, and host of The Enneagram and Coffee Podcast, a daily podcast dedicated to self-care, personal growth, and creativity. Hello, Sarah Jane. How are you feeling today? Welcome to the podcast. Hi, I'm so excited. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Good. I'm happy to have you. So tell us your story on how you got into Enneagram. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found the Enneagram Actually, when I was a burnout prevention and recovery coach, I met some friends at a party and my partner and I were talking about ourselves and they, I think, heard our type structure and what we were saying. And they were like, you should check out the Enneagram. And so through the process, we took the quiz, we read up on all the types and I, it took me a really long time to discover my type. And in that process, I just became obsessed with it. I got so excited about it in seeing it work with my clients who were burning out was amazing. So I was able to see not what they were doing, but why they were doing it. And we were going so much deeper, so much faster. Okay. So to start us off, like, tell us what is Enneagram and how deep does it really go? The Enneagram is essentially nine distinct personality types, and it's really focusing on your worldview. It's so deep that it's everything that you've ever thought. <laughs> it's like the water you're swimming in. So so often we don't even recognize that our type is driving us until we find the Enneagram because it's everything. We've built our entire being around it and we assume everyone else is doing the same. So for example, like if you're an achiever, you think everyone else is trying to to reach their goals. Everybody's driven toward goal and, and, and fears failure. And it infiltrates everything, you know, our relationships, our work, our self-care. It's in it all. So yeah, there's nine types and they're all based off of what you think you're supposed to be in the world. Okay. Is there anything that these types are based off of? Like who discovered it and how, you know, what's the, I guess the root of it? Yeah, I think the root's a little shady, honestly. Like, it's a little, like, esoteric. Um, there's so many different hands that have touched it. But the work that we're most familiar with really comes from a man named Claudio Naranjo, who made it more popular in the 60s. And he applied psychology to kind of some woo mystical stuff that was happening at the time with numerology. And so it came together and he created, a, here are these nine distinct types and here's how they function. Here's what they fear. Here's what motivates them. Okay. So for the listeners who are beginners at the Enneagram, how can we begin to understand it? Yeah. I think the simplest way to understand your type is it's who you think you have to be in the world. Meaning this is the role you think you have to play in order to earn love, belonging, acceptance, success. And through that, oftentimes it's it's our greatest strength, right? And then it's also our greatest weakness. So, you know, the things that make us the most amazing and the most unique and really stand out and come more naturally when done at the wrong time to an intense degree can sometimes cause harm or not serve us or do the opposite of our intended actions. Right. So it's that idea that sometimes our greatest strengths are also like our greatest weakness. Right. A hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, give us more detail on like, what can you tell from Enneagram and what can't you tell? So you can tell why you do what you do. Um, so what's motivating your behavior? You can't tell your Enneagram type by your behavior. 
So a lot of times you'll hear stereotypes like all type ones are are clean and organized. And for some, of course they are. And then for others that they have more of a perfectionistic tendency, that's their title. For some, that's more of a moral perfection. They're focused on being a good person. They don't want to do the wrong thing. And so that moral perfection can get put onto cleanliness, but it can just as easily be put onto relationships or to workload and details. And so it's it's important to remember that it's all about why you do what you do, not what you're doing. So basically you can't like judge someone and see what their type is based on what they're doing because it's it's about the inner layer, like the why. Yes. And honestly, I think that's what makes the Enneagram so special is that it's self-driven because you can't look at someone and know their motivation. So you get, you tell me what your type is. You discover and you tell me so that, uh, you know, you're going through the exploration journey versus here's the results of a test. This is who you are. Go on with your life. It's, it's much more introspective. I see. Okay. So can you briefly go over the nine types? (laughs) Yes. And which type Um, are you? I'm curious. Oh, I'm an Enneagram 7. Okay. Yeah. Do you know your type yet? Look, I took Enneagram like years ago and I think it was four. But okay. Is is this something that can change over time or are people generally, they stay that type? Your type stays the same, but we change. So as we grow, we start to look less like our type because the goal really in Enneagram work is just to be able to access all the numbers and show use the skills of each number at the right time and place. But most of us kind of get stuck in one for a while, if not always. Okay, so let, let's go through them. Okay, so type one is the perfectionist or the reformer. This type fears being evil or corrupt, and they focus on being a good person and doing the right thing. We have type two, which is the helper. This type is focused on if they are lovable or likable, and they fear not being liked or loved. We have type three, the achiever. Their focus is on not being, they fear not being worthwhile Mm. and they seek significance through achievements, what they accomplish. Then we have type four, which is the individualist. This type is focused on finding and seeking their identity and expressing it outward to others. This type fears not having an identity or not being significant. Then we have type five, which is the investigator. This type is focused on being informed and being capable and competent. They fear not being capable or incompetent. And then we have type six, which is the loyal skeptic. So they kind of hold this tension between they're very loyal to people, but they're also skeptical of new people. And this type fears being without support and they are seeking support and they seek to be supported by others. And we have type seven, which is the enthusiast. This type fears being trapped in emotional pain and they seek um, being without limitation. And we have type eight, which is the challenger. This type fears being betrayed or being physically harmed and they prioritize being strong and powerful. And we have type nine, which is the peacemaker. And this type fears loss of connection and they prioritize making peace, keeping the peace and maintaining those connections with other people. Let's take a break for our sponsor. This show is brought to you by BetterHelp. Getting to know yourself is a lifelong process. We have so many layers to uncover, and even if you think you've dealt with everything, something new might trigger you and reveal a wound or pattern in yourself that you didn't realize was still there. Healing is a journey, and therapy is all about deepening your awareness and understanding of yourself. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. Online therapy has been a helpful tool for me to talk through my past and my emotions, to recognize my limiting beliefs and patterns that I need to heal from. BetterHelp therapy is entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule, not to mention more affordable than in-person therapy. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash TLL today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash T-L-L. Another thing that I have heard in Enneagram is there's like wings. Can you explain what that is? Yeah. So the Enneagram is shaped in a circle. So we have type nine at the top and then it goes nine, one, and then all the way back to nine. And each on 
Each number has two numbers on either side of it. So those two numbers are what we call your wings, which are essentially just a flavoring to your dominant type. So let's say you have the peacemaker who is just very calm. They, they want to keep the peace. They don't, they're not very opinionated. They're surrounded by two of the more opinionated types on the Enneagram. They have type eight, which is the challenger. They're like powerful and strong and forceful. And then we have type one, which is the moral perfectionist, right? This type has like a very strong sense of right and wrong, good and bad. And so accessing either of those really changes the way that nine shows up. Is it a nine who's peaceful with a little bit of kind of strong edge? Or is it a nine who's peaceful but has like a moral perfectionistic kind of um, proper presentation. So um, typically we lean into one of those wings or the other, but the goal is to balance those wings out. Okay. So you're saying it's your wings must be the numbers that are directly next to your number. Yes. Ah, uh, and then we typically like lean into one more than the other. Mm-hmm. Ah, uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so the, each a type that has more of a dominant wing is going to look a lot different than the type with the other wing. So that's why you might meet like two type nines who look very different from one another. Right. What if you can relate to different numbers that are not next to each other? Like I think sometimes I might relate to a seven, right? Yeah. There are so many lovely connections in the Enneagram. So um, one of those is your health and your stress and rest line. So these two lines that move to and away from your number. So when you are stressed out, you can a type four could look like a two, become a little bit more people pleasing, a little bit more accommodating, even if it stresses them out. Um, and then we have, they move to one in rest, which is a little bit more structured, a little bit more morally perfecting. That being said, those are two ways you can access that number. Four and seven are connected because they're both idealistic types. So we are the ones on the Enneagram who want, I think the world could be as perfect as it is in our mind. And so we struggle a lot with frustration because life is never as perfect as it is in our imagination. And so that's um, four, seven, and one are all idealistic types. Okay. So you're saying it's possible, like there's a reason why you might relate to multiple numbers and there's different explanations for that. (laughs) Yes. Oh, interesting. Okay. And then going back to the fact that each number has like a positive expression and a negative expression. So how did that show up? Is it more, once you have the awareness, you're like, oh, I know how to balance it now. I would say the Enneagram leans relatively heavy on the negative. So as you read your type, you're like, a lot of people feel a lot of shame when they first read it because it's as if someone's been following you around and they're telling all of your private thoughts and maybe pointing out things that you feel a little bit embarrassed to be seen in. And in that, you you also are able to see the strengths, but I think it really starts with here's your blind spots. Here's what you've not been noticing. And then as you play it out in life, right, you can kind of draw these natural conclusions. So for example, as a seven, I seek happiness. I seek joy. And on the negative, that looks like escapism, right? It's like I can't commit to things for too long because if it starts to feel painful, I think I'm settling for something less than happy. But then that also limits your ability to commit to things and it limits your ability to be a stable adult. So as you grow, you become more competent in these skills. But at the same time, that same weakness is what has caused me to travel to so many different countries and have so many different experiences in life and meet so many different people. So they're connected, but I you can learn to embrace the strengths without living in the weakness. Right. So is the goal with Enneagram to kind of not let that that weakness or that that why drive you? For example, like I'm thinking about the achiever, like there is a part of me that could relate to that as well, where I used to prove my worth through achievement. And then as you get older, you start to let that go. You start to not need that. So is that the goal of Enneagram to like not need your motivation? A hundred percent. It's essentially our protective mechanism. It's what's guarded us. And so if we are safe and we feel comfortable, we can kind of let that, let that down. Okay, so how has Enneagram empowered you in your life? Can you give us like the examples? Yeah, I was the queen of burnout. Like 
I, I, one time when I found the Enneagram, I was working with a business coach and we looked and I had 10 different income streams and no marketing plan to get to any of them. So I was just chasing every idea that I had because sevens, we just run rampant with ideas Mm -hmm. and I wasn't asking for help. I was just trying to do it all by myself and I was exhausted. And through learning the Enneagram, I was able to understand that I was trying to distract myself from pain. And so if I just learned to sit with my emotions and allow them to have like this natural flow of, you know, emotions are all temporary, right? Like negative emotions, they come and then they go. And, but my energy thought, if I dip my toe into the sadness, I will get, it'll be like quicksand and I'll just get taken under. And I had to learn they're temporary. And the more that I was able to sit with negative emotions, the more I was able to commit to kind of the more boring elements of the process that actually make things successful and committing to seeing things all the way through versus just chasing every new exciting opportunity. Right. Because I was saying based on your type, what motivated you was like joy and fun, right? So you, instead of doing what was hard, you would always jump to like the next idea that was fun. So it's the, the challenge is to let go of that. Yes. Yeah. And, and being much more willing to sit in the moment. Can you go over, like, because I'm sure listeners are like, what about me? What about my type? So maybe like for each type, let's talk about like their goal. What do they have to let go? Love it. So for type ones, uh, just one element I think I can give, there's so much complexity in the Enneagram. So a little teaser um, for type one, I will say it's about learning that there's not one right, right way and that you are not broken or flawed if you make mistakes. Um, Type two, I would say it's about learning to give yourself the love that you wish you would receive from others. Mm, Yep. For type three, it's about learning to set goals based off of how you want to feel in your life, not what you want to achieve or like metrics of how you think other people will see you as successful. For type four, it's about learning to seek your identity as yourself not outside of yourself, meaning not seeking the identity of artist, but seeking the identity of who is Eileen, right? Like who am I as I am? Then we have type five. Um, For type five, I would say it's about learning that actions given with love replenish you. So a lot of times type fives believe you get a certain amount of energy in a day and every interaction and everything you do is just taking from you. And if you turn that around and it's an action that fulfills you or an action done in love, that your cup can get filled back up. And sometimes they will set such strong boundaries because they're fearful of being depleted. Mm -hmm. And then type six, it's self-trust. Learning to believe that you're not going to make a giant mistake. Everything's not going to fall apart just because you trusted your instincts. It's about building a, a sense of your instincts are correct. You don't need to go to like nine different other people for advice before you make a decision. For type seven, it's sit with pain, see the joy in the present moment. For type eight, it's all about vulnerability, letting people see you for who you really are, which is like this, honestly, internally, this like ooey gooey marshmallow love pit Mm -hmm. that you're protected by like lots of strong spikes and like (laughs) barbed wire and armor. I I already know this type of person, right? They're, they they wear the armor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're like tough and like aggressive, but then often are like paying the rent for their parents, right? Like they're taking care of people all the while kind of trying to seem like they aren't and that they're tougher than they are. Um, which that armor, right, that you're keeping bad things out is also keeping love from coming in. So you have to learn to let some little bits through. Mm -hmm. And type nine, it's about really understanding who you are and what drives you and what you love, giving yourself time and attention. Nines are amazing at giving time and attention to everybody, non-judgment, patient listening, but they don't give it to themselves. So they need to learn to go out, get to know themselves, journal, explore who they are, what they want, how they feel. Yeah. Listening to all of these pieces of advice, I'm like, okay, multiple can apply to me. (laughs) Or like, I'm sure our listeners can relate to more than just one because we're, we are a blend of so many of these. And I love how it's, it becomes so clear, like through the types, like these are tips that people 
talk about in general, like how to set boundaries, how to give love to yourself. And it, it's interesting to see it like categorized. Yeah. My, my book, the Enneagram letters is written to the part in each of us that is each type. So exploring like what part of you feels like you have to be loved, what part of you feels like it has to be successful, because I do believe that we all receive all these messages all the time that we're supposed to be everything to everyone all at once. And the hope, yeah, is to pick the right appropriate, like pick the type you want to be in the moment. Mm -hmm. If you were to sum up, I mean, like... If, you know, the Enneagram is the way that we are motivated based on, in an unhealthy way, how would you sum up how to motivate, how to, I, where to find your motivation from a healthy place? Yeah. So um, can I go through the types for this one as well? Sure. So type ones, you're morally driven. So when you're in tasks, you, it's helpful to remember like who's benefiting from this, what good can be done in this. For type twos, it's, you know, honoring the part of you that loves people, that respects people, and motivating yourself in a way you can say, like, who's going to benefit from this task? Even if I don't get affirmation in return, can I give without expectation of receiving? Mm. Um, for type threes, it's it's driving that motivation of, I'm going to, you know, you're going to be goal-driven. Type threes are goal-driven people, but are these goals pointing toward how I'm perceived by others Or are they pointing to how I feel and how I perceive myself? Uh, For type fours, it's am I looking for satisfaction outside of myself or identity outside of myself? Or am I looking for identity internally inside of myself? For type fives, that information that gathering that they do, am I gathering information um, without consciousness, just kind of trying to be prepared, trying to make sure that I have everything that I need? Or am I gathering information consciously, intentionally for a purpose? Um, In type sixes, you know, am I loyal to this person because they're loyal to me, because they give back to me and it's a fulfilling relationship? Or am I loyal to this person because I'm afraid of what will happen if I'm not or that I'll be without support if I'm not? Um, For type sevens, we can easily be motivated by satisfaction and pleasure But is that satisfaction here and now, or is it imaginary satisfaction that could happen in the future? And then for type eights, they're typically driven by like power and feeling strong. But what would it feel like to be driven by gentleness and softness and allowing yourself to be powerful without force? And then for type nine, they're driven by keeping those connections, but they tend to do so at the cost of the connection they have to themselves. So how can you prioritize that desire for connection with yourself and really get to know who you are? Amazing. Wow, it can go so deep, right? As we take a break from the podcast, I'd like to thank Lumi for sponsoring this episode. Let me introduce you to a product that can help you feel confident and fresh all over your body. I'm talking about Lumi Whole Body Deodorant. This is not your ordinary deodorant. It's a uniquely formulated and pH balanced deodorant created by an OBGYN who wanted to tackle day-to-day odor below the belt. And the best part, it's safe to use anywhere on your body from your underarms to your feet. Personally, I love the toasted coconut scent and I'm blown away by how well Lumi controls odor for up to 72 hours. Lumi's formula is powered by mandelic acid, which stops odor before it starts. Unlike some deodorants that mask the smell with fragrance, Lumi is more like a pre-odorant. As a special offer for listeners, new customers get $5 off a Lumi starter pack with the code TLL at lumideodorant.com. Lumi is spelled L-U-M-E. The starter pack comes with a solid stick deodorant, cream tube deodorant, two free products of your choice, and free shipping. Just visit lumideodorant.com and use the code TLL to get your discount today. What advice do you have for listeners in like gaining insight and clarity from their Enneagram? Like any, like how would you recommend them learn about it? Are there any like prompts like journaling to, to really understand how they can use this? Yeah. So not, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm on the podcast. I'm like, not to be self-promoting, but my book, The Honest Honest Enneagram, I really believe is a great place to start. It, this is my first book. It walks you through what I call the honest method. 
And it walks through each type's strengths, each type's blind spots, how they show up in relationship, ways to be more creative, get more of your creative work out into the world. And it really breaks down each Enneagram type in much, in a ton of detail. And every type has, every honest letter has action for you, practical tips for growth. Okay. So the honest Enneagram. All right. So moving on from Enneagram, I know you're a huge advocate for self-love. So can you talk about that journey, your self-love journey first? Yeah. You know, I think that growing up, I think especially as women in our society, we're trained to doubt ourselves. We're trained to like make ourselves as small as possible in every way. And I, I did a lot of reprogramming as I grew, right? So, and I think that started really in my photography journey. I started out as a photographer and started doing boudoir photography and getting to know women and talking to them. And I would say my boudoir photography started as like, let's edit you. Let's make you like as like perfect as possible. Let's polish everything. And then through meeting women, talking to them, asking them what they love about themselves, what their partners loved about them, I something just changed in me. I think you can't spend a ton of time with other people in their underwear for like that much time without starting to see every body as beautiful and wow. every individual as interesting. And I just started to fall in love with all types of people. And, and I realized that if I'm able to see you and just love everything about you, then why would that be so hard to do to myself, right? And and I'm overcomplicating this relationship that I have to myself. And so through that, and then I went through a divorce and just had this chance to fall in love with myself again and give myself this chance of my, my undivided attention. I cultivated this like deeply loving and like a deep friendship with myself. Mm. And it became so natural. I forgot that other people weren't experiencing that. And my partner, he really struggled with it. He was a four and he really struggled with self-worth. And we would go through conversations and I would just hear him and how hard he was on himself and how self-neglecting he can be sometimes. And I just realized like everybody needs this. Everybody needs this like relationship, this tenderness that is available to us. Um, if it, and if you have it with yourself, you can have it constantly. Give us more insight on what was shifting, you know, from from the how you were before, how you saw yourself before, to like how you are now, like how much you you love yourself. Like, how did you make that change? Because a lot of people are still struggling through that. Yeah, you know, I think it started for me with body image, and I think I'm so glad it didn't end there. I think oftentimes we think self love is like. I'm beautiful. I'm hot. Like this kind of sense of I can look in the mirror and like what I see, which I I want that for everybody. I love that for everyone. But I think what's more exciting is body neutrality, this sense of like my body is the least interesting thing about me. And I am like getting to know myself. So I think this journey and I think the Enneagram is this beautiful access point to understanding yourself in these deep and intricate ways, the way you would a lover or a friend, where you are asking them interesting questions, you're listening to their answers, um, you're giving yourself like true time and attention and exploration so that you you feel valued, you feel respected. I think through that as well, you build trust, right? Like what mm-hmm. does every relationship need? Every relationship needs you to be interested in me, right? You need to think I'm worth my ta- your time. I need consistency. I need respect. I need reliability, right? So giving that to myself just as much as I would want a partner to give that to me or I would give that to someone I love. I love that. And I, I want to echo that part about like my body's the least interesting part about me. I really like that because I think a lot of people struggle with loving their body. Mm-hmm. Like it's hard mm-hmm. to go from hating to loving, right? Mm-hmm. But what if you just like see past it and like there's so much more that's interesting about you. You have yeah. so much depth in your personality that you can learn to embrace and love. So mm-hmm. I think that's a good place to start. Mm-hmm. Me too. And I think sometimes we think like, my body has to be a certain way in order for someone else to love me. So we get preoccupied with our bodies. Um, But if you think about people you've loved, truly loved, you don't care. Like 
we don't care. Like these little flaws in them become these beautiful intricacies of what we love about them the most. And that's the love we're trying to attract anyway. So being obsessed with if our body's perfect or not, we're just attracting love that we don't even want or a fake version of love. Right. What would you say would be the hardest obstacle that you had to overcome in this self-love journey? I would say other people's opinions about what a confident woman is allowed to be or how confident you're allowed to be as a woman. I think it's almost, especially if you are societal, like for some of my friends who are like much more like societally attractive, you know, they have like all the things you're supposed to have or whatever. When you embrace that confidence, sometimes comes with backlash. Mm -hmm. And I think what you have to do is continue to choose yourself because at the end of the day, you will be the only one who's there with you, right? Like you have to be able to live with you. That is the most important thing. It impacts everything else. So if we can start with that access point of how can I hold soft, nurturing, loving, curious space for myself every second of every day, then I will be able to hold soft, encouraging, loving space for everyone else. And ultimately, like my my presence is going to be a source of healing, whether it makes someone uncomfortable or not. Right. I, I love that you brought that up because I see that too, like regardless of how a person looks, if they show confidence, there's all there is backlash. And it's almost like, I, it's people projecting their own insecurities on this person because they wouldn't be that confident. It's to, scary. Right. It, it's yeah. like we talk about self love and we promote confidence until someone comes out and people are like, oh, no, 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 no that's too much. <laughs> that's too much. Yeah, right? that's too far. That's yeah, pushing my edges. And it's like, yeah. like there are no edges. That edge is that person's insecurity. And I don't think people realize that. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. And I think the most important question we can ask ourselves is why is this making me feel that way? And when, and then this goes back to, if you have a loving, curious, conscious relationship to yourself, when you're triggered by like that, you ask yourself questions. You go like, whoa, why is that making me feel this way? Who do I think I have to be in response to this? How small do I get to be or how big do I get to be? Right. It's almost like if you have a belief, like you can only operate in these limits, when you see someone else like going beyond the limit, it's like, how dare you? You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to like talk, like show yourself that way or talk in that. Uh, Yeah, I I definitely see this on social media all the time. It's fascinating. Yeah, we do this through the lens of our Enneagram type too. Like I think if someone's complaining or they're negative or they're like having a bad day and they just are like sad... I, if I'm not conscious, will be like, whoa, like off put, you know, Mm -hmm. like, oh, you're not allowed to do that. You can't just wallow in your sadness (laughs) because (laughs) I don't let myself do that, right? Exactly. a restriction I've put on me and therefore I'm like applying it to other people. Yeah. And the work isn't in them being more of what I want them to be to make me comfortable. The work is in me allowing myself space to wallow and feel sad and like swamp a little bit. Oh my gosh. I Yes. This is something I think more people need to be aware of and understand is like, because people get triggered all the time by things they see online. Oh, she shouldn't be saying that. You shouldn't be posting that. Oh, you went too far. And it's like, why don't you take a look at yourself and why you felt like that was too much? Because maybe you're limiting yourself. Wow. Love that. Okay. Um, so next I I do want to ask about your lifestyle because you're so into like self-care, personal growth. So what does your life and your habits and routines look like? Okay. Well, I have to preface this by saying I love habits and routines. Like they bring me so much pleasure, so much joy. And I don't think they're a morally superior option, right? Like if some people are like routines make me feel caged in, they make me feel suffocated. I I respect that. For me, they give me so much freedom, so much space and flexibility and places to play. So I have a lot of structure. But I start with my morning routine is the happiest place on earth. (laughs) I journal. I like read every morning. I do yoga every morning. I really try to like make myself a breakfast. I used to just eat whatever was easiest, like put a bagel in and run through the door. But I've started to really see it as an act of love to take time for breakfast and really make it special. Um, And then each 
evening, I have just like a little wind down routine, you know, and then um, I structure my weeks pretty beautifully. I think I do like give us the details. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, whatever you'll have, I'll give you Um, (laughs) admin days on Mondays where I focus on like working in the business. Um, Tuesdays and Thursdays are my social days. So I'll do interviews or record podcasts for my own podcast. Um, I film a lot on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Wednesdays are just mostly content creation, Instagram content, all of that. And then Fridays are what I call CEO days. So it's like moving the business forward and projects that make me like pitching brands or, you know, pushing things forward, which I often would neglect that in favor of just the day-to-day tasks that had to be done. And then Saturday I reset. I do like all the reset tasks and then Sunday I do nothing, just absolutely nothing. I love it. I love it. It's kind of similar to how I like to run my week too. I I like to batch things like you, like every meeting or podcast on one day, admin days, content days. And then I like to do Fridays as like my catch up day because I usually have a lot of tasks I don't, I I, I didn't get to because I I always overestimate (laughs) what I can do. Um, Yeah. So I always need like catch up days. I love a catch-up day. Yeah. Um, So back to your morning and evening routine. So how much time do you allot, like generally for these? My morning, I give a lot. I give a solid three hours. Okay, nice. Um, Yeah, it's good. And we have a kiddo, so like it it, that process is a lot longer when you have children, you know? So I try to get up first, but sometimes you can't, sometimes you can't. And um, yeah, so that's about three hours. And then evening, I keep really simple. It's like... A solid, I probably 30, 45 minutes. Okay. That's that sounds definitely doable. Um, how has your, you know, when you have a kid, it like your priorities shift, right? So how have you been able to find that balance where you give yourself enough self-love and time? My theory is that my kid is gonna learn how to be a person, not by what I teach them, but what I do. So if he sees me neglect myself, be overexhausted, resent him, resent my life, then he will grow to see himself as an obligation and me as like like being a person, as like being burnt out, being exhausted. And so one, I want to set a good example. But two, I also recognize and I'm trying to absorb for, I think this will be a forever journey, that quality time is way more important than quantity time. So if I can't give him every second of every day, then that's okay. Because if I can give him 30 minutes of my undivided attention where I'm curious about him, I'm compassionate, I'm my best possible self, and he really knows that I'm like prioritizing him for that time, that's going to mean so much more than if I'm spending every minute with him, but he, I'm irritated and grumpy and frustrated with him the whole time. So that those two things I think are are key for me at least. Yeah, no, that's really great advice. And then it also reminded me, like you used to work with, like talk about burnout. So, so how have you? What have you learned from doing that? And how do you structure your life to avoid burnout? Oh my gosh, I am always thinking about future me. So everything that I do is for future me. So all the content I'll make this week is for next week. Um, everything that I'm doing is in advance because for so long I lived in reaction mode of just everybody can get to me at all the time. And I, it was chaos. And the other thing I've had to learn is really, and with that reactionary time is creating containers. Like we talked about, like one kind of work. So that way I can get my work done much quicker because I'm in a certain kind of flow but that also includes just not being available via email all day long. I think that was the number one thing that people were doing mm-hmm. because was they were in there. Everyone, right? Everybody, all yeah. the time. They were answering texts. They were responding to emails. They were constantly available to everyone. And I would just, that was the first thing I would instill in people was like, you get one hour in the morning and one hour at the end of the day. And that's your email time. And you have to make the most of it. And otherwise you're unavailable. Mm, I love that. Yeah. And ideally, right, if you run a larger company or you like being a boss, like you would delegate a lot of tasks. Um, For me, I like being a solo person. It's more enjoyable to me. So I will prioritize what I can do based off of 
that. Like I might scale slower, but I enjoy it more. But for other people, maybe scaling faster is more important and that's totally okay too. But you'll right. have to delegate. Like you're not the type that's like, some people are like hustle, hustle, hustle towards the goal. Like you're mm-hmm. more like, let me get there in a balanced pace without burning out. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to feel good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So it ties back to your Enneagram. Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> okay. As someone who was like more of an achiever in the past, it's something I've been learning is like to go slower and to be more balanced so that you don't burn out again and again. Because <laughs> I, fa- I found myself getting caught in these cycles of burnout, right? Where I have energy, go hard, and then I'm like, I'm exhausted and I have no motivation for life. And mm-hmm. then I, Yeah. Well, and a lot of times what happens is with threes specifically, they'll like build these like really intricate, fast paths to a, to a place they don't even want to go. And then they get there and they're like, I've, I've made it to the top of the mountain. And then you're like, I don't like this mountain. There's this other mountain over here that's like much taller. I'll just like build a really fast path to that mountain. And then there's always like another mountain in the distance. So there has to be at some point you have to find the mountain that's right for you and let yourself climb at like a moderate pace. Like it has to feel good for you at the end of the day. You're not doing it for anybody else. Yeah. And then going back to, because I, I told you my type was four, but when I took this test, it was probably like 2015. So I think during that time in my life, I was really trying to prove that I was an artist, you know, because I yeah. was just starting out in my career. I was like, I don't know. I, I did all these, like I, I did a makeover where I dyed my hair like pink and purple. And I really, like I was trying to like prove my identity to to others because I wasn't sure if I believed it myself. And then now I'm, I feel like I've learned to let it go. So I relate less to, to that number because I'm like, oh, I don't really need to prove anymore. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's amazing. So Sarah Jane, what is your definition of your dream life? Oh, my, oh I love this question. Um, my definition of my dream life would be traveling so frequently that Like whether that's once a month or living different places for seasons of time, in my current circumstances, I think it would look like going somewhere for, you know, once a month, traveling to somewhere new. And then every other time, it's just like living on like a little cottage house on the water somewhere with like a little sun room where I write and I have like a long, luxurious morning routine. I write for like half the day. The other half my, of my day is like other kind of more mindless tasks that don't take as much creative energy. And then I just like work in my garden. I love it. I see it. It's so, it's, you've painted it out and it's beautiful. I hear the birds chirping. Yeah, that's perfect. No, I love that. And then how far, like how close do you feel to your dream life now? I feel like I live that life. I work probably twice as much in that case. And I don't own my home. So, and it's not on the water. So we're pretty close. Yeah. You have your long, luxurious morning routine. (laughs) Yes, I do. And there's birds and I have a a porch. Right. And then in terms of travel, is this like like I, I'm at a place where I don't have kids yet, but people say mm-hmm. like, oh, once you have kids, you can't travel this and that. But since you do have a kid, what is your stance on that? We have split custody. So we have our kid every other week. So in that way, I can organize it pretty strategically. But if we had our kid full time, I would feel even less guilty about traveling because um, they're with me every single day, all the time. Like as it is now, we feel like we have to make a hundred percent of the time we have together as valuable as possible. Mm -hmm. But if your kid's with you every day for the rest of their lives, like they need a break too. And so give them a break, give yourself a break. But also I, I love taking our kid with us places. I want them to like grow up with this rich cultural understanding that I didn't have. Like I didn't travel until I was in college and I, yeah, I was very limited by that. Yeah. So there's so many like positives from like exposing them to the world early and it's totally possible. Totally possible. Okay. Amazing. So at this point in your life, what are you most excited about? I'm honestly most excited about just making things, creating things. Um, I'm really enjoying reels right now, which is interesting because I was 
livid when they came out. I know. <laughs> like, did not want to do it. I was right. like, don't. And now like YouTube too is like shorts are the thing. And I was just so curmudgeon about it. But then I think I just decided to have fun and was just like, how can I make this fun for me? And it's not my most successful content, but I'm having fun. And I think that's what matters. If you're going to make content for a living, you have to like balance it, I think. You have to find a way to make it fun. <laughs> like it can't feel like work because even it, like if you create out of that place of obligation, no one's going to enjoy it. Not you, not the audience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For months there, there, I was like so resentful, you know, just so like frustrated by my job. And then I needed to step away and really like evaluate and be like, how can I make this one? How can I increase my compassion and how can I make this exciting again? Yeah. What are your strategies for yeah, finding that motivation? Like sometimes, you know, as a creative, there's always times where you get stuck or blocked. So what do you do? Boredom. <laughs> boredom. I, okay. Yeah. It's so hard to be bored in I our know. society. It's so hard. And there's but too I many think, options to entertain ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And everything. I mean, there's just everywhere. So even conscious boredom, I think, is like the best thing that any creative could do for themselves because you have to hear your own thoughts. And I could go my whole life for the rest of my life and not hear my own thoughts again if I wanted to. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Most people live that yeah. way, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so what does boredom look like to you? Like intentional boredom. Do you mm -hmm. just, yeah, what are you doing? Are you sitting there? Are you walking? Are you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I find it really helpful to just sit there. Like, so I turn off my phone. I turn off like any screens. And I honestly would say I sit for maybe 10 minutes and then my brain decides what to do. So it, I feel like we think like, oh, this is going to be so painful. It's going to take forever. But like you start to figure things out. Maybe you go like make some food or you like work, like change your flowers or you water your plants or, and then you'll start to think and you get ideas. It, it happens pretty naturally. It just feels so painful. Like if I just, it's going to hurt so much or you start reaching for your phone unconsciously, but it happens pretty fast, I think. Oh, that's amazing. It's kind of like people don't realize that ideas will come if you give, if you create that space, right? I think a lot of people are I mean, sometimes I do this where I sit in front of my computer. I'm like, okay, I have to write something, <laughs> right? You're trying to force it out, but it doesn't always work that way. And Yeah, totally. Yeah. I'm a firm believer that creativity needs input, export, and boredom, mm. silence. So we need new ideas coming in. We need to put ideas out or we, we get kind of frustrated and like clogged up. And we need silence. And I don't think that silence comes at the same time or like ideas come at the same time as creation. I really believe they happen separately. Oh, what do you mean by that? Like inspiration comes through boredom, through doing things, through getting out of your comfort zone, through like getting input, trying new things. And then that doesn't happen when you're sitting at your desk, like looking at the wall, you know? So often for me, it's like I get my ideas outside and then I go and I sit in silence and I'm able to make those come and turn into something. But I see. Yeah. We oftentimes we sit at a blank and look at the wall and we're like, why don't I have any ideas? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're just looking at the same computer we've looked at for like seven days straight. Right. Right. Okay. So how soon, like say you're doing something, you get an idea. Are you the type that like, like you believe in acting on it as soon as you can? Or do you, do you just like put, make a note of it and then come back to it later and you still have that inspiration? I think that there's, I keep an idea note um, because I tend to act on things really fast and that gets me into trouble because I'll like start a lot of things and not finish. But at the same time, there are ideas that if I don't act on them fast, they're not going to be as alive. You know, like sometimes you have to just put a pause and go like, I have this energy. I need to really let this energy come out because it's going to be so much more beautiful now than if I try to come back and look at it later and I don't have the same zeal for it. Yeah. That's what I found as a creative is that sometimes I have these great ideas, I'm inspired, and then I come back to it a week later and then I'm like, I don't feel it. Like I, I it, it, you kind of have to force it. So I learned that if you have energy to do something, you should just act on it because it's not forever. It could leave you. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, so lastly, if you want to leave the listeners with one piece of advice, what would that be? Hmm. The piece of advice would be you are 100% worth the exploration. Give yourself time and attention every single day into who you are, what you feel, how you're being impacted by things. You are worth the time. And if you want a starting practice, you can ask yourself just, what does my heart, mind, body, and creativity need today? And let that be a good starting place and answer that question every day and then try to give it to yourself. Mm. Is that what you try to do? <laughs> like, do you think about that and journal on that? What does yeah, my heart need? Oh, wow. Yeah. And it has it, does it always lead you to something different? It often does. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's like my body needs water, like a lot of water every day. And that's interesting. Like, <laughs> Or sometimes it's like yoga every day. But oftentimes I'll surprise myself, especially with creativity about like what would help me feel creative today. Maybe it's having, like today it was like having a coffee break, going to have coffee, just sitting with a book and giving myself that time, which I wouldn't have done if I hadn't asked myself that question. I love that. So you have to ask yourself this every day. Like, what do I need? What do I want to give to myself? Amazing. Okay, Sarah Jane, where can we find you online? Um, I am on Instagram at Sarah Jane Case. I have a podcast. It's three days a week. It's Enneagram and Coffee on anywhere you listen to podcasts. And then on YouTube, I have a little baby YouTube at Sarah Jane Case as well. Amazing. We'll link everything in the show notes. Thank you so much today. And thank you for sharing your energy and your knowledge with us. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me.